in the room with those of us who are here, especially because um, Saku has also been involved in some of this work as well. Um, but I want to welcome you to panel 57, Unlocking Democracy. Um, and we're going to talk about ways to um, work that we have done in Illinois primarily um, to provide more access and to make folks more aware of their voter eligibility for those who are in jail, um, who are eligible to vote, and for those who um, are out and may not know that they have the right to vote, or for those who are in states who are really recognizing this right and working to expand it. Um, in the 10 years that I have started to dip my toe into this pool, um, so to speak, the progress that's been made in this area is really quite stunning. I was thinking about it today um, as I was getting ready. And about 10 years ago, when I was pulling together the final parts of my book, which was not on this subject, it was on minority um, race and redistricting. And I interviewed what was, who was then the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Mel Watt. This is around 2010. And I asked um, why, had, had there been talk about including voting uh, rights for people with felony conviction as they were reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act of 2006. And he said it came up and the Congressional Black Caucus had discussed it and determined at that point that it would have been too much of a third rail uh, or a lightning rod. And so they, they decided to sort of put that off to the side and maybe create separate legislation specifically for that. So obviously that didn't happen. Um, and um, obviously for many reasons. Um, and so to see the momentum that is behind these issues now in 10 years, which in political science and legislation speak is pretty quickly, um, is astounding. And what I think is more astounding than that is, is the fact that that momentum is coming from people who are directly affected. It's, it's not being done primarily on behalf of that population. That population is, is, is very politicized, which I think many of us in our discipline have, have uh, underappreciated. Um, and I think it's that momentum from them, from folks on the inside, including on the outside, um, who are getting us started. So with that said, I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, we have Ami Gandhi here, who is with the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, who has done a lot of work in this area uh, in terms of litigation and other things. And then we have um, one of my former students, um, Shamaya Bird, who uh, has been a stalwart member of a law and policy think tank at the prison where I teach, and she took a class of mine there. Um, we'll talk more about that as we get going. I am going to shut my volume and my camera off and respond to one of the panelists um, who was on the way, I hope, uh, Nasir Blackwell, who can speak from this um, from a more personalized perspective. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Gandhi. Thank you. And welcome, Patrick, and welcome to Neil. And I hope you don't mind me calling you by your first names. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ami Gandhi. I am a senior counsel with the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And I lead our organization's voting rights work in Illinois and Indiana. And I have to say that for me, the bright spot of this work is getting to collaborate with people like Professor Rivers, like Shamaya, like other community members and colleagues from a variety of professions who share the value and share the passion for working with community members in the criminal legal system to expand voting rights. And while the last year has certainly looked different for the trajectory of that work um, compared to when we previously could spend time together with colleagues in jails, in prisons, to be working on advancing voting rights in a more hands-on, in-person, tangible way. Um, I really respect that this movement has progressed, um, even despite all of the challenges of COVID, because of community members and leaders like yourselves um, continuing to keep in mind the need to expand voter access and advance racial equity. And um, as Professor Rivers mentioned, at uh, our organization, we do try to use legal tools to advance the protection of voting rights. And that can take a variety of forms. If we have to resort to litigation, uh, we try to stand ready to be able to do that. And sometimes there's no choice but to file litigation against government authorities, for example, to hold them accountable when there is resistance to providing the voter access that they should. 
But also I want to share with you that in Illinois, there's a tremendous amount that we all have been able to accomplish together when trying to work collaboratively with government authorities um, to improve election administration and to formulate and implement laws that expand voter access, um, like the voting in jails and civics and prison laws that you'll hear about today in, that we've passed in Illinois. And so it's, I think because of the dark and, um, and, and negative history of corruption in elections in Chicago and Illinois, our government leaders, and in some cases, even on a bipartisan basis, are trying hard to get away from that history and that reputation. And so there's some relatively more openness in Illinois to um, voting reforms that can be more equitable and accessible for, for voters. So wanted to share a little bit of that context as well. Um, thank you so much for the chance to join this conversation this morning. Uh, I, I feel very honored and humbled to get to join you all. Thank you, Ms. Gandhi. Um, I see that we have uh, Nasir Blackwell who has just joined us. And um, so Nasir, I'd like to welcome you in and then we'll have um, Shamaya tell us um, who she is and every and we can all, you can both talk about how you got into this work as well. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Rivers. Good morning, everyone. I am so honored um, and blessed to be with you all this morning. Really looking forward to this conversation. My name is Shamaya Bird. I am a former DePaul student, um, DePaul alumni, and my major was political science. I got involved in this work um, from taking a class, a political science class with Professor Rivers. Um, I want to say the summer of 2015, and one of the representatives of um, our Inside Out program came and spoke to her class and was explaining um, all about Inside Out and what Inside Out was. And being someone who has not been affected by mass incarceration directly, but I have been impacted because I have family members. Uh, it was a no brainer to me to like really get involved in this work. And so I did two inside out classes and really enjoyed it. It was very impactful um, and really grew concrete, like solid relationships with the inmates there. Um, and from there, I pretty much just participated in the think tanks. Um, and yeah, of course, is just echoing off of what Ami previously stated, you know, um, to do the work side by side, not just with community members on the outside, but um, just hearing a lot of the stories coming from the inside and how eager they are to push this work forward um, has been very uh, monumental in that keeping me motivated to continue to push the needle and push this work forward. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Shamaya. And at another point in the session, we'll come back around and you can talk more about how it was to collaborate on that legislation. Um, that we wrote at Stateville. So, and I'll give a little bit of uh, background on Inside Out in a minute, but for those who are wondering what um, Shamaya was talking about there, it's a program um, that is taught at um, prisons and jails that brings in outside students to learn alongside incarcerated students on the inside. So I've dropped the link to that in the chat for people who are curious about that program. Um, Nasir Blackwell is here. Thank you so much for making it on my short and mistaken notice. Um, so please introduce yourself and the work that you do as well and your involvement in, in this particular topic. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's not, um, I'm so accustomed to like early morning Zooms and conferences and um, not saying I was looking forward to the weekend off. So I'm not blaming you, Professor Rivers. Um, I had to speak. I mean, when you brought this to my attention, this is dear to my heart. Um, for those 
you have never met me, I'm Michael Nasir Blackwell. I work with the Inner City Muslim Action Network, Iman, right? I'm a community organizer there and I do policy work around criminal justice reform. The reason I'm very passionate about that because I was formerly incarcerated, um, learning about our justice system from the inside out. Um, my rude awakening to what the criminal justice system is truly about, it was a blessing and an eye opener at the same time. It was a blessing because I found my passion. All the wrongs, the injustices, the policies, the structure, what we call this institutional structure. I'm not even gonna be talking about the racism and all of that, just the former, the structure that's in place because a lot of people still get caught up in it. My passion came from that, coming from inside that structure, seeing all the wrongs and working hard to correct and right those wrongs. I've literally changed and written policies from inside the prisons, um, changing the way the prison maintained um, the cleanliness. They, it's called, um, uh, what they call it, uh, the sanitation department, uh, security and sanitation, safety sanitation department. That was created as a result of a group of us coming together filing grievances against correctional staff and going on letter writing campaign to legislators. And they literally came to the prison and investigated what we were saying and we got that problem changed. We addressed the illiteracy problem in Danville prison. That's where a lot of my work developed from Danville prison by creating tutor programs. And then within three years of us launching that, we had the highest graduation rate in the state of Illinois prison system. Unfortunately, um, again, we're fighting the structure. This is why my passion is here because this fight still continues. Unfortunately, there are people with ideologies that's different than ours and truly believe that we are to be incarcerated. And one man told me that if it was up to him, I would only get bread and water. <laughs> So we're still dealing with these nuances in regards to these people's mentality. And this is why this type of work is so important. This is why we got to come back inside to expose these types of thoughts and practices. Um, I give thumbs up um, to Professor Rivers and man, I'm trying to think of the sister name and it hurts me that it, it slips mine. Um, the EJ there, Oh, Rebecca Ginsburg. Rebecca Ginsburg. Yeah. My thumbs goes up to her. She worked tirelessly to bring higher education in the Illinois Department of Correction, right? And for some of you that may not know, she had to literally fight against the Correction Officers Union. Unfortunately, these are the individuals that are our oppositions. This is who we are fighting against. And right now my work has been very passionate about building a bridge, the gap of the bridges of the divide so that we can start communicating because if they start feeling what we feel, then the work is even 10 times easier because they're gonna bring it in. There's a lot of correction officers used to bring this work in, but if I'm correct, uh, correct me on, on me if I'm wrong, um, who was it that passed that law? Uh, was it Edgar? The no fraternization law that if a correction officer is now how they define as communicating with an inmate, they can be charged, I believe, with a class four felony. So that enforced that institution where even those with a sense of humanity wanted to bring change from the inside out couldn't because they was legally barred from doing so. This is why I'm doing this type of work, not only to expose this, but to continue to make sure that those are still inside receive the attention they deserve. That's what's most important. Thank you. Um, so because this is a, a fairly small session here, I want to, I'm going to throw out a few questions um, to the, the three of you. And I invite um, our, our guests here in the group, our visitors in the group, um, to add your questions as well. If you just want to put them into the chat or raise your hand, and we can just have this be conversational as roundtables tend to be. So what I'm going to do is just ask three questions and each of you can um, pick up whichever question you want. Um, and one of them is what, what do you think has led to this sort of turnaround towards support um, of voter access and civic engagement for community members who are either in jail or who have a felony conviction who are either in prison or who are out? 
Um, another question is, um, what do you think are some of the main challenges to expanding voter access among these community members? And then what are some successes that we can speak of um, both in Illinois and um, outside, of the U outside of Illinois? Can I begin? Uh, so the first one is, what do you think has led to this sort of change in public sentiment, if you will, and even governmental sentiment uh, towards more support, I'm not saying it's universal support, but towards more support of voting rights for people who have been caught up in the criminal legal system? Um, and what do you see as still as, as some of the major challenges that exist um, and then um, some recent successes and what do you think might be behind those successes? From my observation, um, I've only been home six years now. Um, from being inside, all of us on these letter writing campaigns trying to gar garner everybody's attention, right? Filing our grievances, filing our civil rights complaints, you know, unsuccessfully. I think what really, really brought to everybody's light and to attention is multimedia, the internet, right. Twitter, Facebook, yeah. right? Um, People are communicating quicker now, broader. Their, um, their footprint is much larger now in regards to their audience. And I think that is what's bringing a lot of light and attention to the plight of what's going on in regards to not only voter disenfranchisement, but all major forms of disenfranchisement in regards to access to healthcare. You know, uh, just to receive good time for completing a college course or a program. So I think that came forth because of multimedia internet and organizing also. The second part, most importantly, is organizing. People are really, really organizing now that it, now that everybody is aware, they are organizing. Mm -hmm. They have returning citizens coming home. We're more acquainted now because of the smart device. Mm -hmm. oh, seriously. Mm -hmm. When I came home, the brother texted me with everybody's phone number. I had to learn how to use this. <laughs> I'm serious. I had to learn. My daughter taught me how to use that. Mm -hmm. And it was that device that kept me quickly. I'm talking about without getting on a, a phone, a landline, trying to remember something, call her. It was that platform, I believe, wow. that like created the, I want to say, a, the lightning bolt. The information is going out so much quickly and people are organizing so much effectively because of um internet so i think that had a lot to do with it because in the 90s when we were fighting we didn't see none of these type of changes until after 2000 mm. going into 2010 right yeah. so now the word is out people are aware and they're organized uh the biggest challenges that we still have is legislative you have a lot of states with an own constitution forbids individuals the right to vote because of a felony conviction. We're campaigning right now in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Taxation without no representation. That's our mantra. That's our stomping uh, 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 um, march. I mean, our, our not our rhetoric, but this, that's our, this is how we're yelling it. Mm -hmm. We're working with state legislatures. This, the, the biggest part is legislative and ideology. And the challenge is going to be education, bringing everybody on board and educating people. This is not only a fundamental human right, but how are you going to tax somebody and tell them they don't have the right to vote? That you're not going to represent their interests, but you get to make laws over their very function of their lives. And they don't have no say in it, right? That's ignorant. So we still live in a world like that today in the 21st century, unfortunately. So legislatively, there's talk about a referendum, right? To um, either amend or abolish the 13th Amendment definition of how it's defined of what is a slave in the state, those convicted of a felony. It's defined as a slave of the state. It still exists today. So that's going to be hard because these things are in front of our faces. It's hard to talk to your opposition when they're standing in a right under legislative law. I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's the challenge. 
Yeah, it does. And, and I appreciate your emphasizing, you know, the difference that social media has made has made, you know, as a political scientist, I'm thinking, oh, it's it's just a political opportunity structure. And I'm thinking of all these you know, jargony things. Um, and, you know, what you said is right there in front of our faces. It is so much easier to communicate with people quickly um, and in a more organized fashion with these tools and these platforms that we have. And so on that, I'd like to sort of turn these questions over to um, Ami and to Shamaya, because I know you have really been running with that opportunity as well. So if you could um, say more about these questions. Thank you so much. About, it was almost exactly four years ago when the US Commission on Civil Rights held a hearing in Illinois about voters' rights and voter access in our state. And Professor Rivers and Nasir, who are very humble, and for those of you um, new to talking with us, and we, and we welcome you to this conversation today, um, because my fellow speakers are so humble, you may not know what their incredible leadership positions are in this movement, and and um, and and all of you um, being willing to speak about this issue about disenfranchisement of community members in the criminal legal system at, at a formal federal hearing um, that was open to the public where election officials were milling around and other government officials call it spying or call it whatever you want, you know, but they're listening and they're taking note of who's being critical. And that's, that's the context that we're in and being unafraid to be specific about the disenfranchisement and to call it what it is and to point out the injustice of it, even if it's something that is accepted by society to take away the right to vote from citizens. Um, I, I think that it's made a big difference in terms of the Illinois based work and the advocacy that there have been. Uh, and just because it was four years ago when I first heard them speak doesn't mean it was the first time they were speaking about it. You know, their, their work even predated that. Um, and I think that that really has made a meaningful difference in the legal advocacy and policy advocacy in Illinois. Um, and the, another factor that I want to point to that has made an important difference is having input from community members and voters and people who are not yet eligible to vote, but who should be, who have firsthand experience with these matters, it makes a huge difference. Um, in, in my civil rights work, one of the things I notice is that government officials have a much harder time opposing a, a reform or a suggested change if the person proposing the change has really thought it through, has thought through what it's going to look like in practice, how something can be practically implemented in a jail or a prison. Um, and and so you know when you when we hear Nasir talk about these are some of the structural, legal, and practical reasons why. Um, community members who are incarcerated are pitted against correctional officers. We need to know that if we're trying to require in-person peer-led civics education and know your voting rights information to returning citizens, then we have to have a practical idea about how would that even be implemented in the first place in a prison. Otherwise, we don't really stand a chance in trying to change the system. And so kind of translating the bigger picture ideals to the practical election administration and what, uh, what curriculum and um, know your rights information could actually look like in um, a specific correctional facility, I think that makes a huge difference for the credibility of our movement and, and the power of the movement. Shamaya, did you want to add anything or? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I'll jump in, thank you. Um, I would echo a lot of what was already previously said um, in alignment to what Nas Nasir had stated so far as social media. I think a lot of it too is just the momentum around it. I think folks are really in particularly Millennials, I just want to kind of give the space to highlight because I feel like 
um, we are changing the narrative in the sense of um, like we're not taking whatever it is being handed to us, especially so far as like in the education realm. And so I think that um, there's a lot of progressive folks who are realizing that the system is dated, the system is not work well it's working exactly how it was designed to work but um we are pushing the momentum around legislation i think part of it too from a political perspective is that you have folks in office um who like the the public pressure they are taking advantage of the public pressure that's being put on and so I think it's a variety of many things so far as um how the sentiment is changing but I, I definitely believe social media and the forms of communication um is a big part of that as well that's something I didn't even actually think about but the, it, it makes a hundred percent sense Thank you. Um, I want to encourage um, folks who are arriving um, to please feel free to chime in with uh, comments or questions. It's a small but strong party here and I don't want to um, do this where we're leaving out your input. So please feel free to either um, use the raise hand function or um, just drop a question or comment in the chat to just jump in when you would like. Um, Shamaya, that was a good pivot that you made um, towards sort of the politics of, of things. And speaking myself as, as a political science um, instructor, and, and those of us who are in the room here, um, you know, we're typically not taught to go out into the community to study some of these phenomena that we're writing about, um, whether it be about mass incarceration or healthcare policy or you name the, the public policy issue. We're, we're, we're taught to, to do field research, um, but particularly when it comes to mass incarceration, what I'm learning and reading is, is there's there still tends to be a gap in terms of whom we talk to or sometimes we'll do things like surveys which are again somewhat distant um, and so um, I'm wondering what folks have to say and this question is for everybody in the room um, of how scholars your suggestions um, Shamaya and Nasir and Ami um, and and how us how we as scholars can become more involved um, what what can we do better what can we do that we're not doing? Um, what are some ideas that folks have in this room about how there could be more collaboration between um, our, our community members who are affected by the criminal legal system um, and scholars, especially for those who are on the inside who can't just reach out and typically call us? Some can, but it depends on the state and the rules. So I just wanted to throw that larger question out there. How can, I guess we better coalesce and, and in my view, and I'm biased, um, how can scholars um, sort of reach out more and, 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 t and, t and strengthen these connections in ways that I, I personally don't think we do enough of. Sorry for that contorted grammar there at the end of the question. That sounds more like an organizing question. It's what we have to do on the ground organizing, you know, with our contact. At Iman, we do that very well when organizing our base, especially with the young adults that uh, we reach out to within the community. Uh, Inglewood, now that we're in Inglewood, Gage Park, Chicago Lawn, uh, Market Park, we definitely is reaching out to them and providing them like a form of structure to be involved in. That's an, So I say that to say this, that we have to begin organizing around other entities building an alliance with other organizations across the city of Chicago. More importantly, organizing within the prison. Um, I love how Ami brought that out. There's a lot of legislative work that we really have to do, either repealing laws, especially the fraternization law, or amending it. Like, you can keep the law on the book. However, you shouldn't be going after a correctional staff member if they're trying to bring humanity <laughs> within the prison system. You shouldn't be prosecuting a person for that. You know, we can amend those laws uh, to make it more amenable to the conversation on bringing this within the prison system. But on the ground, now that we have access to multimedia and, and uh, social media platforms, we can use that to our advantage in the organizing capacity. 
and just bring this conversation to everybody's doorstep. Because the biggest problem I see is you can have civics education in the prisons, but if a person don't desire to vote, what purpose did it serve? If they still feel like the system isn't going to work anyway, and they're not going to vote just on general principles. All that work gone for naught. If you can't get the community even to stand behind the idea that this is important and it builds power because they've been powerless for generations. So how can you show someone what true power is if they don't even understand the definition of it coming from their perspective? That's, that's why I see the first season difficult because that social platform, the organized capacity is we got to help people understand what power is in a collective voice and why it's so important to be involved in the democratic process. So Shamaya and, and Ami, can you tell us more what that empowerment looked like on the inside? You all were very, very involved in legislation that was written in Illinois um, to provide, to mandate voter education as part of the exit process from our Department of Corrections. Um, and Shamaya, I think you were at the, the very, very nucleus of that idea um, in your class project. So can you both tell us more about how that looked, um, that typical, that, that, that type of collaboration that was largely done um, behind the prison gates? Yeah, so I, <laughs> I, I um, <laughs> yeah, this is such a impactful question um, because I, I was in the beginning and um, it was such a, impactful experience in that it I feel like it started with community building right like creating that space where we and when I say we I'm referring to DePaul students uh to, yeah DePaul students on the outside because they were considered um DePaul students as well we did not look at them as just inmates we did not look at us as just people well we had to reconsider our privilege and I think that's where it started first of just being students um undergraduate students at the time who had an opportunity to learn side by side with inmates and so from like touring the place to having um classroom discussions around previous legislation, uh, much of the content was very relevant to what was going on even now. And then hearing um, the inmates perspective, I don't like to refer to them as inmates. Um, so I'm going to change my language to um, incarcerated citizens because they're still citizens. So just as Nasser has stated, like have given that educational background and I think creating that community to where everybody was the same, no matter what background you came from, no matter what you were sentenced for, um, just having that common space where we can be able to build that community is where it started. And then from there, just seeing the common goal of what we all wanted to see change what we wanted to see be different um, stemming out from the inside going out to the outside and so holding ourselves accountable as the Paul students um, to go out and educate folks on what we were doing on the inside I think was major key to this as well because I believe that's part of how uh, Dr. Rivers was able to bring um, key players like Ami and and uh, Chicago votes in like holding ourselves accountable to educate people on the outside I think was and then being able to organize around that as well so even beyond legislators like just telling regular everyday people um, like people in my family what was going on so that they are educated and then moving from there um, building momentum and they were able to go tell somebody else as well so um for me, I think community building, 
was the biggest thing and setting that foundation um, that they are still citizens that, um, you know, as Nasir stated, why it's important for them to be a part of the democratic process, why it's important for them to vote. And then a lot of them were older. So just like from a millennial perspective, like just being able to sit and just listen to them because they have these impactful um, perspectives and insight on how the system has been working within. And again, checking that privilege that we have and just being able to go and yeah, educate folks on the outside because a lot of it is unlearning, at least it was for me, and then um, learning from their perspective. So, yeah. Okay. I believe that Don Warks has a question before um, we go on to, to Ami's response. Thank you. Um, the, uh, sorry, first of all, I apologize for getting here late. I was really excited about this, uh, this uh, discussion. A couple of things, when you all were discussing the, um, you know, just the idea of, of, of getting folks in, involved in the voting process, right? Folks who are formerly incarcerated or incarcerated. And I just, I just was thinking about um, kind of what, what I, you know, what, what a lot of organizers talk about, you know, it, it's almost like a, 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 it's a tool, voting is a tool. And so before people even need to want to use the tool, they have to kind of have an objective, right? So, 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 so the comments, uh, I believe Nasir was saying about, you know, getting like, you know, uh, the organizing being at the root of everything, uh, that, that just really struck me because it's like, it's the process of getting people to A, in, envision what they want to have happen um, and then feel empowered that, that it's possible to make that happen. And then, you know, you start looking for the tools to try to make it happen. And then voting would just be one of those tools. And so I was just thinking about that process of, um, you know, uh, of help, uh, of helping or providing a pathway to facilitate uh, for folks to get from, you know, a, a place of disempowerment to a place of kind of having a vision of what they want to then trying to figure out how they can get it, you know? So, so, so I, was, I was really struck by this idea that it, the, the, the root of this is gonna be in the organizing, not in the, you know, showing people how to register to fill out a voting form, it's really, that that pre, that process that that leads to them wanting to do it right and then you give them the, the opportunity so i just wanted to throw that out as kind of a question re, re, reaction to what you guys were saying um and then how these spaces that are created uh i'm assuming you all doing like an inside out type program because I didn't, I didn't hear everything that that uh at the beginning um but the creating a space that would uh uh, uh, uh facilitate folks coming to that uh, uh, that to that, uh, I don't know. I won't say a uh, uh, notion, but but getting to them to that to that 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 political space where okay, you know what, we're in this position now. How can how can we transform our own conditions or try to transform it? And then you know you know let's look for the tools. And then folks like us can kind of help them get the tools. You know, I don't know if that makes sense. But. You know, it does, Don, and, and the, the thing that I really learn is as a political scientist, and again, I'm going to keep emphasizing, and maybe I'm beating up my discipline too much, um, you know, but we're way out, we're way in the back, kind of looking at a distance, sort of squinting into the distance, especially when it talks, talks you know, comes to, to looking at issues having to do with incarceration. And so one of the things that I learned that, that really um, contradicted and, and corrected, I think, a lot of, of bad notions and wrong notions that we in our discipline have about this population is that they were already politicized. You know, and, and early writings, and you've read some of this stuff, early writings that, about incarcerated people and, you know, it, such that it even existed. It wasn't even on our disciplinary radar, right? But early writings would often portray people with a, um, who've been impacted as being apolitical or apathetic. And certainly there's a percentage that are just like the regular population. Um, but some of, some of the stuff that I've read at least, um, it sort of paints, paints with a very broad brush. And so I was immediately corrected um, when teaching this class. And, and yes, it was in the Inside Out program and, and others can attest to this as well, that they, they were already politicized. It's just because of this lack of communication uh, having to do with some of the laws that Nasir mentioned, where we can't talk, you know, to each other. Once we leave the institution, we can't really talk. At least that's how it is in Illinois and a lot of states. And, and there's just not a whole lot of 
I think people talking about who they're talking about who are incarcerated because those aren't conversations that we typically have with each other, right? We, everything is kind of on the low. Um, and so I, I was instantly cor corrected, like I'm not telling them anything that they don't already know in this class, you know, any more than I would be when I'm teaching a class at DePaul. There's some things our students don't know, right? Um, but this is a, a, a really politicized population. And so with that, I wanna pivot back to, kind of to Shemaya and Ami because you all worked on a, on a survey that, that measured um, political engagement. It was a small survey, um, but that measured political engagement and, and, and awareness of political rights at Stateville. Since then, the Marshall Project, and I'll, when I stop talking, I'll drop a link, has been doing a huge project on um, voter awareness and civic engagement uh, for people who are incarcerated. And there's a really good survey that's come out of California. So if, if um, the three of you would want to talk more about just, you know, how um, civic and political engagement happens when you're behind those walls and you have limited access to, to news and to media and, and to, to all that stuff. And, and as you're talking, I'll look for these links. Thank you for bringing that up, Don. I'm glad you mentioned the survey, which I can take no credit for, but I, I can't overstate how that survey and the findings from the survey that DePaul colleagues worked on with incarcerated community members, how much of a game changer that was for changing the laws in Illinois. Um, being able to take away, and I say this as an attorney and not a political scientist, so you all scientists can laugh at me when I say this, but um, even aside from the formal part of the research and this, the statistical analysis and the careful wording of the questions, and I greatly respect all of the work and um, professional expertise that goes into that. For me as an attorney and um, a, a civil rights advocate, having a few sentences of reliable information that I could take away from that, that were super compelling, um, made all the difference in terms of trying to advocate for a law that incarcerated community members helped write and pass. Um, so specifically, the, the few sentences, which now we copied and pasted everywhere, you know, in our collective advocacy over the years, and we're not done yet, um, but saying that showing that such a high percentage of incarcerated community members are interested in voting when they have the right to do so. Um, but that also an overwhelming majority didn't know that they would have the right to vote upon release and didn't know how to exercise that right and how to get registered. I mean, that is really a stark way to bring it to a government leader and say, there's a gap here. And as Professor River said, we can't assume that the gap is because of unmotivated citizens or you know, fall into that trap or uh, that misinformation about people um, because the numbers don't lie. And so that was really helpful um, as a starting point for um, us to collectively to try to change the narrative. And I, I do wanna mention something that Shamaya shared that I wanna lift up as well. Um, the fact that in this work, we, or at least I, have to constantly check my privilege and question my assumptions. I think that's a healthy thing. I think it makes it possible for people from different professional disciplines, like we all are here today, um, for us to be able to work together and get somewhere together. And um, that's part of my experience with that is from these very people, uh, my esteemed co-presenters on this panel, and being willing to do that. Anytime we go into the prison, being willing to question my assumptions about the language I'm using, um, you know, mid sentence and ask for input because I may have heard input and gotten felt solid on it last week on what I was saying or hearing and things may have evolved because language evolves, you know, and, and people's preferences e evolve around it. And so uh, I think that's as much of the work as anything mm -hmm. else. Um, and allows us the chance to hopefully continue to get to work together if we're willing to be um, open to that. And I know for me, um, you know, specifically as a non-Black person of color, I think that's been an important part um, of the journey of figuring out how could I possibly fit into this um, and being aware that sometimes I might not fit into this movement, but if there are ways that I do and I can 
help or be a part of it, um, just to, to be open-minded about what that might mean. Thank you. Um, there, yes, Don. You all said, you, you guys said something that was fascinating and I hadn't thought of it in this term, but um, the notion of civic engagement uh, amongst the incarcerated, um, I mean, that, that's a powerful idea. Like, like the, the, the ways, how do you, well, can, can we promote notions of civic engagement amongst the incarcerated or to, can we detect it and, and facilitate um, means for folks to, to, to engage? Um, and, and, and aside from voting, I know we're talking about voting, but, but voting is, is like, voting is so important, but it's just like, it's like the smallest way that we can engage. So it's, it's a weird thing. It's like, it's a, it's a, it's an extremely important act, but it, it's also, it can be just once a year, right? Or once every few years. Um, uh, but the, but the idea of people being engaged in, uh, you know, in, in, in thinking about being a participant in democracy uh, is fascinating. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you guys could talk about, you know, just that, that, that as a broader concept of, of facilitating and encouraging democratic participation uh, amongst the incarcerated beyond, um, you know, where voting is a key part of it, but just that orientation, is that, is that something that folks are working on trying to, 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 to either encourage or to help, to help to, uh, I won't say empower, but help to give voice to, right? To, to the extent that there's a sentiment and, and ideas already there, which, which is detected in these surveys, like, like how, can, how can we help to give platforms and mechanisms and mean vehicles for this, for this orientation to be manifest? Uh, I, I, I hope that makes sense, but but that idea of being engaged behind, you know, while incarcerated, I mean that that that's that's powerful. Nasir, do you want to take that one on? I have my answers, but I, I want to hear from you all first. <laughs> Can I have a question again? The, the, I guess in, in the simple, in, 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 let me simplify what I'm trying to say because I, because of my ideas and spinning in a lot of different directions. The, the notion of people being, who are incarcerated, being engaged politically, you know, while they're incarcerated, right? So you can't vote necessarily, but maybe there are other things that you can do. Are there, are there uh, efforts on the way to either cultivate that or to give uh, uh, ways or vehicles for people to kind of to 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 express that sentiment, um, um, and and because I I can see that as really being connected then to the efforts of trying to get the, you know the the vote and in, in, engaging people in the voting process when they leave. That's a good question. Um, yeah, just like uh, Professor River is saying, the brothers and sisters inside is highly politically motivated. Um, the biggest problems they have when trying to move on an action is resources, right? Because they're confined either in a six foot by nine foot cell or by a 10 foot, 12 foot cell, uh, they don't have access to internet, phones, or none of that, unless someone smuggles a phone inside, which you can lose a year off your sentence if you're caught. <laughs> yeah. But, um, there's no access other than you writing a letter mm -hmm. or you get on the phone and you have a loved one call someone. That's your means of action, right? So for civics education to educate everyone inside, one, to empower them with that knowledge that there exists an entity on the outside that has your back. So while you're on the inside pushing, we're on the outside covering your back. Don't worry about that. We got you. Those are one of the greatest things that they need that as long as someone got their back, because it's very hard to push on an action in an itty bitty box. Mm -hmm. And then someone has a key and they can keep you in that box until they decide to open that door. And they do that an awful lot it's called segregation. So um, that's very difficult for someone to mobilize their political thoughts in that confined manner. 
So if it wasn't for us going inside, making sure that their voices are heard on the outside, they will continue to be isolated. Because this is nothing new. If you look at the history of movements mm -hmm. in the prison system, it, re it literally models the same behavioral practice. Look in the 70s, mm -hmm. when the Muslims brought humanity in New York prison. Look in the 80s, when Pontiac went up. And in the 90s, when the Correction Officers Union effectively, effectively mounted a campaign, misinformation, but they was able to lobby to lock every prison down in the state of Illinois, every prison either for 21 hours a day and you only allow it outside yourself for three or for only 18 hours a day and you only outside yourself for six. This is what we're up against, right? How can someone have this desire to speak out when they're up against a group of other individuals suppressing that desire? This is where we come in at. So, they're highly educated, highly motivated, and highly incarcerated. <laughs> right? That's 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 what's happening. Because you will hear the voice a lot more. Mm -hmm. And prison conditions would not be in the system that it is today if they had the resources to get their voices heard. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. why it's so important to have this. Yeah, Don. The first thing that comes to mind when, when you ask that question, um, a couple of things did, because my head is spinning like yours is, is, is what's really needed is more coalitional engagement and collaboration between those on the outside and those who are on the inside. Because again, folks who are on the inside, they're motivated, they're listening, they watch TV, even if they're only getting a few channels, they're, they're paying attention. I would come into class, you know, weekly and, and they would be half time, they're giving me the news updates that I hadn't heard because, you know, I was distracted or grading or something along those lines. So, so that, that's the, that's some of the best news of all. There's no need to politicize people who are on the inside. They're there on some level, they're more politicized than we are, you know, because it, it's, it's such a, 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 an elusive thing to, to, because they can't actually get engaged in it, right? Because of all these rules that, that Nasir just referred to. And so, you know, once I fixed my face around that one, because again, I came in with some not horrible, I hope, preconceived notions, you know, I didn't think I was going to walk into a room full of people who were asleep. Uh, but the level of that engagement that that survey that that was that 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 survey revealed to us was stunning. And that was, again, not just our state bill survey, these other two larger surveys bear that out as well. And I think the public has really slept on that and particularly academics. But the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is one of the biggest wet blankets is this power that corrections officers unions and those in authority have is retaliation. I got to tell you, for part of, of the work that we were doing in, in this think tank, and I would encourage faculty if they're interested in this, you, you don't necessarily have to go teach in a prison to, to start to volunteer in a prison. You can propose maybe a policy think tank or a politics think tank. Um, and so I ended up creating one once my class was over because that was the only way that would justify me going in there and continuing to work with people because I can't visit or call uh, as a visitor. I, my status doesn't allow for that. My clearance doesn't allow for that. So one of the biggest fears though was retaliation. Uh, the last thing the corrections institutions want are politicized incarcerated people. And so I, you know, we all know what code switching is. Let's just say there's a lot of code switching that goes on. Um, and I had no idea how good I was at kissing people's minds um, <laughs> until all this happened, right? Because you just, you gotta get in there. Um, and I, I worried often some about our projects that we were doing. I worried often, you know, because there's always a staffer somewhere around the room. Luckily for our projects, they don't sit in the room and some institutions actually sit in the room with you. Um, but I was constantly worried about, you know, what are, what are they hearing? What are they going to take back with them? Who are they going to talk to? Um, we were working on this legislation at, at the, the prison where I teach at precisely the moment where there had been a, a wonderful debate 
team that was started. And of course, debate teams are nothing new in prisons, right? Um, and so uh, a young a woman started a debate team and the first uh, topic they debated was parole. So already that's a lightning rod. And it was an internal debate. They didn't debate somebody on the outside. It was just eight guys, at the, insiders that debated each other. Um, and by all accounts, it, was, it went well. They had invited many state legislators to the debate. They actually got to go and talk to these legislators after the debate and, and gave them a bill that they had written because Illinois has no parole to speak of in a formal sense. And two day, within two days, that debate team was shut down. Um, there were threats of pe putting people on, on lockdown, of moving them, of putting in segregation, uh, of shutting down other programs. Some of my students were on that team at, for, for a brief period of time. They were not even allowed to talk about it. So we were in the corners of my classroom whispering about, you know, what happened, what's going on, you know, um, it, it was bad. And, and that didn't last really long, but needless to say, it was chilling, right? It was a chilling effect. And so here we were starting to talk about this survey. And so we, we, we had to speak in some, some guarded, pun intended, um, tones, and, and that, that's a hurdle. Um, it's also a motivation. You know, we, we, we became actually much more motivated because of that, but I, I would say one of the biggest um, blockages can, can be retaliation, either perceived or real, um, because, you know, prison staff have a lot of authority, um, and, and I worry more about retaliation that's visited upon people who are incarcerated, but the biggest type of retaliation they can do to, to those on the outside is just to shut your program down. Um, so there's that. Um, I think one thing that um, helps is if for in instructors who you know, are doing this type of work and, and volunteers, I should say, I, I found that it helps to, to know people on the outside who have influence, who have your back, as you say. So to the extent that there are several of us who have, of us who have brought in legislators into our classes, into our think tanks, it's not, I'm not the only one who's done this, right? They see that. And I think, I think sometimes that's helped, you know, that I, oh yeah, well, she walked in with that state senator, he brought in X, Y, Z, that helps. So to the, the extent that we can, curry and, and strengthen our connections with people who are in power, who have some clout, um, who have our backs, that can help. Sometimes it can create some issues, but that certainly has been very necessary. I think there are times when I may have, my program may have gotten canceled had, I, had people not known that I had people on my side, right? And, and I, that's not something you walk in holding over their heads, by the way, um, at least I don't. Um, but and, and that's politics, right? That, that's raw politics. Um, so to the extent that, that those of us who are instructors um, and volunteers and who wanna do more of this work and go inside and do more of this work, it, I don't think it hurts that they may know that you, you know people, if you will. You don't have to lord it over them, um, but I don't think it hurts. Having said that, you know, I, I think that, you know, the horse is out of the proverbial barn, and I think that there are more um, institutions, prison institutions across the country, certainly not all, but more that are open um, to this kind of work, to people coming in and doing this kind of work. And as Ami told us when, when she went to the state legislative hearing, and, and she alluded to today, it's, and, and Shamaya as well, it's very difficult for leaders, even in a correctional institution, to sneer and turn down something having to do with civic engagement. That's part of corrections. And so the tighter we tie those things together, the, the more it helps keep that door open. Um, but there's always a fear in the Department of Corrections of, of um, volunteers coming across as advocates. And when I was trained, I was actually trained not to use that word with the people with whom I interacted in the prisons, because that can sometimes get us run out. So it's, it's a delicate balance, but you know, it is hard. It makes it very difficult to say, oh, you're, you're poo-pooing civic engagement. Most people don't want to be on the record for pushing that away. You know, to this day, I'm still barred from entering into corrections to speak mm -hmm. and Cook County. I can't even speak in Cook County Jail yes. and the Little Department of Corrections has barred. I cannot go in no prison in Illinois to speak. Period. It's it's mind blowing. Um, 
And that's, that's not the case in every state I'm learning. Um, that is the case in, in Illinois, that folks who have come out and, and who have you know, great value in what they're doing on the outside to bring back in, they, they can't do it. Um, it, it. We haven't really been given any substantive reason as to why that is. Uh, I, I think it, the premise was something around you be organizing to do bad stuff. There's certainly no proof of that. Um, and Nasir, that is actually something in some of the legislation that we're working on that, that Rebecca has really been pushing on. So hopefully that will change soon. But these, those types of restrictions really, really matter. They really, that, that somebody who's doing everything that Nasir is doing, especially on the political engagement front, but he can't come back in and talk to other people about this, is, is that's something that those of us on the outside and, 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 and scholars in particular, I think really need to get on the bandwagon um, in, in political science, especially, this is our field. They're on our territory now when they're talking about voting rights. Um, and that's something that I think we really need and, and can and very effectively push back against if we in the academy organize more to do that, which is the purpose of this whole round table. So, so what would you all say would be the, um, the, the primary ways that we as political scientists and, um, and representatives of, of you know, well, higher education in general, um, what are the, the, the main things that we could do to support the, these efforts? Like what would be the, 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 the key steps or, or, or um, the, key, um, the, 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 key, key, the key support, the key ways we could support efforts or the key things that we could do uh, within ourselves to, to, try, to try to assist and promote these efforts? I mean, I know that, you know, the inside out is something I haven't done it yet, but I've been planning to do it and thinking about doing it. And, and uh, I've got a couple of colleagues at my school who've done it. Um, and so we've been talking about really the, the, the steps that involved in doing it. Uh, but beyond even that, um, if you guys could just share what you think of, what are the, what are the key ways that we could support these efforts um, uh, in, in practical ways? What are the key practical things we could do to support these efforts? And I take that, Dr. Rivers. Um, I think it starts with, and I just want to emphasize coalition building and how important that is, not even just on the inside, but building on the on the outside, like creating spaces again, like just changing that narrative that something like this. I mean, as long as this has been going on, the national conference. Um, this is fairly new to me. So creating coalitions and building coalitions uh, within that can like pretty much expound even beyond, you know, political science. Um, because when you think about intersectionality and how some of, you know, this in the political science realm can intersect with things um, like, that's going on with the in the community or things on a uh, even outside of a legislative level, um, a lot of it does intersect, like organizing and political science intersect. And so um, I yeah, I just want to emphasize coalition building and uh, how important that is, I think, and being an advocate for that, because I think about um how we were able to coalition build, um, start, of course, starting on the inside, but then it translated from the outside with uh, some community members such as Chicago Votes and how we were able to build that relationship because they had a very much similar build to what we were creating, like their legislation, they already kind of had. And so we kind of had something to model, but yeah, coalition building is, it's like key, I feel. I think that was a good, um, excellent question. I think the most important thing you can bring down is yourself, right? And the resources that you bear. Um, Shemaya and Ami brought it excellent. Like they're the keys, they're inside already. They just need that assistance, you know, that additional resource of information to share, right? 
And then so these individuals know that there is a broader coalition in support of this. And it's just not a couple people or a handful of people interested. Because we see this cycle go through all the time, especially in lifers. This is not the first time they tried this. They've been trying this in the 80s when the prisons was wide open. You know, we do it. Matter of fact, you get at that time you had uh, Roosevelt University. In the Illinois Department of Correction, you could have got a bachelor's degree. It all went away. So here we are again, rebuilding. And I'm coming from my perspective from the inside looking out, yeah. seeing these cycles. Right? So now here we are again. Is this going to fade away also? I hope not, because it'd be disingenuous for all this hard work and all this energy everybody putting in, right? So just bringing yourself and the resources that you have to bear is very important. And I have not been watching the clock very well, but I'm looking at it now. And I was told that we have a hard stop at 1230. So the two other things I can say really quickly, Don and, and Tamil to you as well, um, is to bring this in, information, find some way to work it into your syllabi and into your classes, even if it's not directly on the topic. Um, because when students hear about a lot of this information, they'll grab on and man, these millennials organize like nobody's business. Um, so I would say incorporate it into your coursework, even if it's just a topic for a certain day, you know, bring in speakers to your classes. Um, so you can easily add it, uh, fairly easily add it into your coursework. And if there's ways you can pull it into your research as, you know, kind of what happened with me, I would recommend that as well. Um, there's also a lot of reentry type organizations that will, you know, kind of help get folks grounded and then from that you can maybe start to make those connections and you know consider just uh proposing a some sort of a book club reading group those are usually well received at a local prison or jail there's a lot of receptivity for that now and, and even online these days as these places get teched up so i would encourage that as well um you know it, it's it's a lot of extra time you know a lot of service but it's ways that can really translate and, and strengthen your overall portfolio, not to put it that way, but that does count um, in some very important ways that will end up revolutionizing what it is you do as a political scientist. So on that note, I so appreciate your, your patience with me and just sort of, I had it all wrong today. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Don. Thank you, Timil, for being here. Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I've dropped some information there in the chat, so I, I don't know if I can I can try to save it. Um, but you know how to find us, and you know we hope to keep talking with you. So thank you. And with that, I'm going to have to be really rude and sign off, or they're going to come yell at me. So see you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>